Hi, I'm Talissa. And I'm Rachel, and this is Transatlantic Crime, a true crime podcast that covers stories from each side of the pond. Every week, we will both cover a separate story with a running theme. Disclaimer, this podcast will contain swearing and details that some people may find offensive. If you are of a sensitive disposition, listener discretion is advised. Welcome Welcome to to Transatlantic Crime. Crime. (laughs) So close. And action. (laughs) I watched a really good documentary, actually. There's a channel, if you're in the UK, it's on Now TV, which is pricey, but like, trust me, it's worth it. It's got all HBO shows on it. Yeah. So it's got like Sopranos, Sex and the City, which I've been getting Vince into. Yeah. He is rooting for Aiden right now over Big. (laughs) So (laughs) I've been watching loads of documentaries on their channel called Sky Documentaries. And there's one called 16 Shot, which is about a black teenager. I think he was 17 called Laquan. I can't remember his second name, but he was shot 16 times. But it was reported that he was shot once. And then when the funeral home, yeah, but just one police officer shot 16 times, which is madness. Right, And he was a teenager as well. So yeah, he was, he was holding a knife, but he, and, and the police officer said he was coming towards him, which when you watch a video, like the footage came out 100% was nowhere fucking near him. He was like, had his back to him wandering away, right. like in the road. Yeah. He was like a threat to himself, maybe. He would, it was quite likely to get run over by a car right. in the way that it was set up. But yeah, so I watched that, which was an amazing documentary. Um, if you're looking for something to like educate you a bit more about Black Lives Matter. And then there's another really good, on there, good one on there called Say Her Name about another black lady whose name I forget, not because I'm Sandra awful, Bland. but because I. That is her name. Yeah. Oh, God. Sorry, I couldn't remember it, but it, this is really off the cuff and I have a shit memory. Down. Um, but documentary is actually a good segue into what I wanted to talk about in reference to last week's episode. Yes. So I just wanted to... Is this a corrections corner? This is corrections corner. <laughs> good segue. I have one as well, but yes, go. I wanted to say that I rewatched The Tales of the Grim Sleeper, the documentary that I mentioned last week. And... Yeah. There's a ton more things, ton more information that I didn't mention, and it was mostly about the Grim Sleeper, so I didn't want to focus on it. But one of the things Mm -hmm. that I believe I made a mistake on is how I pronounced the survivor of last week's episode. I kept saying Henrietta, but Mm -hmm. in the documentary, they pronounce it Anitria. So I apologize. Anitria is the correct way. I believe. Um, as someone with a name that has been called like Tixilix, uh, Talixa, Taliza, like all the names under the fucking sun, <laughs> I can appreciate how hard it is to pronounce people's names sometimes. But yes, obviously you didn't mean to do that on purpose. Yeah, so. of course. But um, I do want to say like, it is a really good documentary. People should watch it. Tales of the Grim Sleeper. And there's also so much more information on how badly the police dealt with it. And just how they mm-hmm. ignored so much of it and how groups came together and started dealing with it themselves, like the Black Coalition fighting against serial murders. They were basically the ones who really helped it along, and they are in the documentary, so watch it. <laughs> it's so annoying that like there has to be a fucking absolute hoo-ha made for anything to get done yeah. sometimes, you know? Yeah, and I think... It's just like, do your fucking job. <laughs> right, and <laughs> I think right now people are concentrating more on... That's one of the big issues right now is, like, the police are meant to deal with everything, so they get all the money, but more money should be given to community groups who are doing things like this so that they can be better at dealing with the community and not leave everything on the police's shoulders who will be biased and who might have racist cops who won't deal with it is that what they say when they meet when they say dismantle the police defund the police yeah defund the police okay yeah a lot of people are like what that means what are we gonna do without cops in the streets it doesn't mean no police anymore it just means give money elsewhere like split up the money 
when people call the police, it's like whether there's a loose dog in the street or there's a man oh, no. <laughs> in the in an apartment barricaded in an apartment with a rifle which actually happened last week in my neighborhood a few blocks away. oh did you find out from your app <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> i have to post a citizen app i said i would do it and i haven't done yes, it yet, so I will yeah do that. that'll be a good one yeah. but no it's like defund the police means rather than calling the police to go get the dog call this other number to go get the dog and call someone who's an expert in mental health to go talk to the yeah. guy barricaded in his apartment with a rifle you know? a hostage negotiator or yeah exactly something. put more money into mental health and more training in police if that's what they keep because they keep making a big deal about how little police are trained um, well i'm sorry but like i know not to put my knee on someone's fucking neck yeah to hold them down right like especially if they're saying i can't breathe yeah it's more than my job's worth to kill you. Right. Like, and they know at the, at the basis a, level. Right. And a police, they're not supposed to do that if someone's handcuffed. Like, that's a, just a rule. There is no need yeah, to do no that danger to if themselves. someone is handcuffed. Exactly. And you don't need yeah. three guys on top of one guy who is handcuffed, which is what happened. Yeah. Anyways, that's our okay. corrections and soapbox corner. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, I've got I've got one more corrections oh, okay. corner because I re-listened to the podcast of last week. Not just because I love my own voice, but because I also um, have to pick out parts to put in like a little trailer. Yeah. And I realised that when we were talking about the Israel Keys case, I said Samantha Keys instead of Samantha Koenig, but that was because I was explaining a sidebar very quickly. Yeah. And I didn't even just notice got a bit that. Mixed. I didn't when I was doing it, but then when I listened back, I was like, nope, that's not her name. So. <laughs> my corrections yeah. corner as well i can't believe i didn't notice I, that i basically listened to it six times over for editing so sorry mate i missed that completely <laughs> okay so the theme this week is children who kill <laughs> we're straight back in with the grimness after i survived there's no more nice for you <laughs> <laughs> that was a one week offer maybe um, one day we can just do weird crimes since it's transatlantic crime and not transatlantic murder Oh yeah, definitely. And like I said, with like my favorite murder and stuff, they've got a bit off piece sometimes. Like they'll do like a plane hijacking or a robbery yeah. or something. Yeah. So I think we can definitely switch up. Yeah. Um, but not until we've got through all the murders. <laughs> so. Every single um, one. Every last one. So okay, you ready for mine? Yes, you go first. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm not going to tell you. I don't think you'll know the name of this murderer anyway, because I kind of didn't. I think because he was a child when it happened, technically, but like legally, they didn't release his name. So when the murders happened, the murders are quite famous, but then the actual name of the murderer didn't get released until he was 18. So even if I told you his name, you probably wouldn't know who it is. That's, but uh, I'm just gonna... that's similar to mine. Like, I didn't recognize the name at all, but I... You'll definitely know the story. Okay, cool. All right. In the early hours of the 29th of March, 2014, um, the police were alerted that there had been a body found in Castle Park, Colchester, Essex. So you know where Essex is, just below London? Yes. Um, south I south used of to London. I to Colchester a lot. Why? Because I used to live in Ipswich. The person I lived we with like... in Ipswich... <laughs> his whole family he, sh he who shall not be named <laughs> exactly uh they lived in essex did they yeah he uh his whole family he was from colchester so yeah i know colchester pretty well oh well, okay well you might know some of the locations here then okay so uh yeah in the early hours of the 29th of march the police um have been alerted that there's a body been found in castle park and um, it's a male victim and he had 102 stab wounds including in his eyes so it's pretty nasty. 102. The victim was Yeah. They always say on small town murder, they're like, get your hand and go up and down 102 times and think how much effort that takes. Yeah. And how much time. It takes forever. Yeah. And you'd be knackered. I'd have to have a break in the middle of that. Like a hundred percent. But I'm quite unfit now. That would take also with like just <laughs> waving my fist around like that. I still need to put up that picture as well of that little, like, 
things <laughs> yes. from this stand. Yeah. Like the conf- confused little white monkey I said you look like every time <laughs> I say something ridiculous about a crime. Again, I'm slacking on the Instagram, people, but I'm not on furlough anymore. I have to go to work. So I've got two jobs right now, and one of them is this podcast. Yeah. No, I was yeah. gonna I was gonna say like count for a hundred seconds because it's not like you're doing it rapid fire, you know. Yeah, I mean maybe you could uh, I don't know. I mean we could do an experiment one day. <laughs> like they do on the like have you seen the really good John Bonet Ramsey um document? Like I haven't even started this story yet and we've already just gone <laughs> off on like fifty five times. It's been twenty minutes. <laughs> Fuck me. Right, okay. I look, there's a really good documentary about John Bonnet Ramsey where they test smashing a pig skull with different stuff to see what mark it makes. Right. You can find it on YouTube. Anyway, the victim was thirty three year old James Atfield, but he was known to all of his friends as Jim. So he was a father of four and shortly before this, after being involved in a car accident, he had some brain damage, so his learning and his reasoning have been affected. So he was kind of considered like a, a vulnerable adult. He was meant to be meeting his sister that night at a bar, but he didn't show up. So she messaged him saying how upset she was. And that was the last text that she sent him, which she felt really awful about. Mm. She's on the documentary just like absolutely gutted, basically. Aww. I know. Which is why you should always think before you send an angry text, <laughs> I think. Don't text angry. That's my advice. I agree even though I do it all the time. Um, so on the night of his murder, he was on a night out and was having a few drinks by himself. And then he took a shortcut through the park on his way home. And he was so drunk that he sat down and then he sort of fell backwards and fell asleep. When the paramedics arrived, he was still alive, but he was bleeding obviously really badly. In the end, they couldn't save his life. So that's one of the worst parts is that his eyes have been stabbed and his torso like he was basically stabbed all over 102 times and he wasn't dead yet poor guy i know and i mean the quickest paramedics would arrive is like 10 minutes yeah so yeah. that's still a long time and how was he um, found did who called the paramedics i think someone just stumbled upon him yeah. like another drunk person yeah the violence committed towards him startled the police and the bbc decided that the details were too gruesome to describe on the news many of the knife wounds were shallow and inflicted purely to cause pain The police had no leads as Jim had no enemies. He was also known as Gentle Jim. Um, Like, that's how well-liked he was. Yeah, and and there were no witnesses to the crime. And you've been to Colchester, so can you confirm that it's a pretty small town? It is pretty small. Yeah. So the stabbing was shocking for the small town, and there was a lot of coverage on the TV and radio. After this happened, everything went quiet for a while. And then three months later, on the morning of the 17th of June, 2014... 31-year-old student Nahid Almenia was walking to the University of Essex where she was studying English as part of her PhD. She'd moved to England from Saudi Arabia and she'd moved with her brother. And usually he would like chaperone her through the park because they, I think they went to the same university. The park was called Salary Brook Trail, if you know it. I don't. Okay. But it's basically like a, a local nature spot. So it's quite sparse and there's like trees either side of it. So you you would walk through it and no one would see you, but it's quite a big area. So she walked through this on the, and this morning she was alone. It was like one of just, just a day where her brother couldn't go with her. And Mm. she was killed in an overgrown area, extremely close to her home. Her murderer had stabbed her with a bayonet in the abdomen before forcing the knife into her eyes. Oh my God. Yeah. It's fucking hideous. And they knew this was on purpose and possibly connected to the previous murder as Nahid had had her sunglasses taken off so that he could stab her in the eyes. This is terrifying. There's somebody hiding in the woods, stabbing people's eyes. This is why I never walk. Like, there's a place near my house and my housemate Carly is like, yeah, I walk the dog there on my own all the time. And I'm like, fuck off. You cannot see the road. Yeah. It's just a big open field, but it's surrounded on all sides by trees. Yeah. If you screamed, no one would hear you. Someone could drag you in the woods, but this is because she doesn't do a murder podcast. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> read I... about this stuff every single day. Non-effing stop. Yeah, so I never, ever, ever, I've only ever gone down there with Vince, uh, my boyfriend, who, like, I'm not saying is, like, the hardest man in the world, but he would at least give me some time to run. So, <laughs> at least there's two of you as well. 
a witness. Yeah. 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 So again, many of her knife wounds were inflicted simply to cause pain. And by this time, Colchester was gripped by terror and fewer people felt comfortable going out in public. So the authorities cleared as much of the undergrowth as they could as possible so that uh, no one could hide in it, which is, again, fucking petrifying. Mm -hmm. Police said that despite no firm evidence, one line of inquiry was a possible hate crime because some people assumed that because Nahid was a Muslim, that it was a hate crime. And this led to Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, otherwise known as ISIL. They threatened revenge attacks using the Twitter hashtag Colchester. What? So it's just like, (laughs) fuck's sake. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I think they'll use any excuse. <laughs> Anything you can think of today that we should use as an excuse for an ev- a revenge check? Yes. <laughs> but something happened in Colchester. I'll get on it. And use a um, Twitter hashtag as well. And I mean, was it trending? Like, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, it wasn't It wasn't a hate crime. But the only people that knew that were the police because um, the police were the only people that knew that they had both been stabbed in the eyes. They hadn't released that information to the public because it was going to be useful. Because, you know, sometimes mental people come forward and say, I did this, even though they didn't. Right. I shouldn't say mental. I should say people who have problems come forward and say they, they did a crime when they didn't. Right. Um, they want the attention so, or... I mean, I can't think of a reason that you would fucking... Why? Why would you do that? Yeah, you've just got to be really mentally unwell or just like attention a lot. Yeah, the police knew that information, but the public didn't. But despite this, the community had pretty much figured out that there was a link because both of the attacks happened in parks and they were both like very frenzied and also that the people were alone. So there's an atmosphere of intense fear in the town. Because of this, the police were patrolling day and night and the town had never seen so much of a police presence. They even brought in police from different towns. Wow. To come wow. and support. And the whole investigation ended up costing them £2.6 million. Wow. They had pretty much nothing to go on as well. There wasn't any forensic evidence left at the scenes and no solid witnesses. So the police worked their way through 150,000 hours of CCTV trying to find something suspicious. And all they could do was appeal to the public. They wanted to speak to a man that was spotted around the area wearing an, and this is in air quotes, Italian designer jacket. <laughs> and like, I'm laughing because all I can think of, if you've ever seen the English office, is like when Ricky Gervais comes in wearing the same jacket as his boss. Yes. Because <laughs> he just wants to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> and he says to him, uh, nice jacket. And he goes, thanks. Where's, your fr- where's yours from? And he's like, Giorgio Armani. And he's like, where's yours? And he's like, Sergio Giorgini. <laughs> <laughs> just like a totally made up shit Italian designer. <laughs> Yeah, if you haven't watched The English Office, I recommend it so hard. Yeah, if you like the but, American Office too, it's like a nice, it's nice to watch them together because you can see where it all comes from yeah. as well. <sighs> see, I don't really like The American Office. It's a real crowd splitter because I've got so many friends who are like, oh, if you like the English one, you should watch the American one. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like it. And they're like, why? But I just think Steve Carell and... Ricky Gervais are completely different types of comedians. Yes, they are. Ricky Gervais is so cringe and like that's what I like about him. And Steve Carell is a bit more sort of shouty and obvious. I but... kind of felt the same way for a while. Yeah. I always liked the English office way better. Yeah. But the American office, once you just binge it, then it's you like just cigarettes. Love it. You just have to get, you just have to get past the bit where you hate it. <laughs> yeah, and the, and, and it gets I think so much better. The first two seasons are are extremely similar to the English Office, and I think that they are trying hard to emulate it. And well, yeah, because I think it, it was it was just like a ready package thing that they could just export to America, get made, and make money off. Yes, obviously, it went on for like fifteen seasons or something. The American Office. Yeah, I think once it becomes its own thing. And you get to know all it's the bad. characters and the storylines and everything. It's yeah. just it's just its own thing. So it's it's separate from the English office, but I like how they are kind of similar at the beginning. So Okay, well how did we get into that? Well, oh, leather jacket. Well, it's, it's Sergio <laughs> Giorgini's jacket, yeah. We put that to bed. So now the police finally get a break when in May two thousand and fifteen they got a call from a woman who was walking her dog on the Salary Brook Trail where Nahid was murdered. And 
she said that she saw a man acting suspiciously and that he has a jacket on that looks really similar to the person in the Italian jacket that they, that they had appealed to the public for. So a police officer turns up unarmed and the dog walker witness stayed where she was and she warned other people not to go near the bridge that he was hiding under. So that was How a fucking... suspicious activity? That he was, yeah, like hiding under a bridge and like looking out and stuff. And he was, so he was, when the police arrested him, he was hiding under a bridge in the undergrowth wearing gloves. What a th- creepy thing to just come across. Like, oh, I'm just walking my dog. There's a man probably with blood on him still with gloves on. I'd have been pulling ass. I'm like, I can call about him. I don't have to be like two meters from him. Yeah. I could just tell you where he is. Right. <laughs> so what? maybe she had a really fucking big dog, but like, I I've got a chihuahua that would that. be of no help. <laughs> I was just thinking like, that, like, if she had a, a big dog with her, then sh- maybe she felt safer, but... Like, if, you, if you've if you got, like, a fucking Doverman or a Rottweiler or something, then you're like, if that guy comes near me, this guy, my dog will maul its face off. Yeah, that's what so, I want, Talissa. That's what I've always yeah. wanted. And now Your I've, dog is I've got, quite small. Yeah, now I've got <laughs> Tito. A big dog in a little dog's body. He thinks he's big, and that's... In a way, all that matters. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Arlo has only bitten toddlers so far. They pretty much deserved it. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, so anyway, he's been arrested. This mystery man. The police arrest him on suspicion of possessing a knife, which he was later found to be carrying. But to be honest, given the atmosphere, I don't think they needed much reason to arrest someone that was fucking being creepy under a bridge in a park where someone had been previously murdered right the person under the bridge turned out to be james fairweather and he was a 15 year old schoolboy. he was taken to the station and he was interviewed about what he was doing with a knife and he just confessed immediately so he describes killing jim in castle park and he and nahima in detail and said that he had voices laughing in his head and telling him that he needed to make a sacrifice or bad things would happen to him. So who is James Fairweather? He was a good schoolboy as a child. He liked darts and he would go and play darts with his dad at the local club. Aww. And people describe, yeah, my nanny, my nanny Trish used to play darts and she was really fucking good. Mm. But the thing is, to be good at darts in the 80s, you have to be good at maths. I know that calculators did exist in the, in the 80s, but you were all, like, drunk in a pub. I can't remember how, basically, darts works, like, and sorry if you know how to play darts, but I didn't for a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you you start with a certain score, like everyone does. Like, I don't know, let's just say 360. Someone will fucking email and tell me that's wrong, obviously. But you, <laughs> you, um, you throw the dart at the board, and then you have to uh, minus whatever you got, from your big score and you're trying to get to zero in one go yes like you can't go past it you can't say you've got 10 points left you can't get 15 points yeah so yeah you have to be really good at maths and that wasn't my forte so i am good at darts but i I can't play it like properly where you minus all the numbers and stuff i think that really takes away from the fun just do what i do and play with someone who will do that for you yes like my nanny trish is now bed bound so (laughs) she's not up for darts but like (laughs) Yeah, I need to play like with my dad or something. Yeah, he's, he wanted to, he wanted to do like a maths degree. Oh, and I was like, oh my god, you fucking nerd! So yeah, he would, and he was really good at maths, so he would do it in a second. Math was his, um, it was my worst subject. Science was my worst subject. Yeah, both of those, math Which, and science. But I, I really like science now. To be honest, I really liked it then. Like, I just it had a bit of maths in it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That fucked me up. It had two th- um, two classes together, and that just wasn't that didn't work for me. Yeah, and plus we got we got to burn stuff, <laughs> and that distracted me. <laughs> it was like let's just burn like uh, crisp and see how long it takes, or like I just got too distracted with the practicals to consider why I was doing it. Right. So it's not my fault, <laughs> basically, is, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, James Fairweather, he was really of his father and quiet that's how people in the darts club described him and there was no trauma or neglect in his youth and he got on really well with his parents and his grandma however things started to change when he got into secondary school and he attended colchester academy and he was bullied for having very prominent ears and if you see a picture of him he is like kind of weird looking but i feel like he could make himself look a bit better 
Also, but... everyone looks weird looking when they're 15. Oh my god, of course. You've got like this weird size head for your body and like <laughs> You're either gangly your hair is experimental. And, yeah, you're you're gangly and don't know where to put your elbows or you're too Your short. trousers are too low down. <laughs> You're wearing your brothers and sisters hand me downs. You just look like shit. Yeah, you haven't figured out how to do your hair yet, so you either try you... really hard or you just leave it. Not how at it all. Is. Yeah. <laughs> your shoes, like you're always like. I remember begging my mum for shoes that like I just wasn't allowed at school. Like they they were like kickers with like a heel on. It's like. <laughs> So you've got like these shit school trousers and a shit school jumper and then these really shoes, well, shoes that you think are trendy, but they definitely aren't. Yeah. Like, it's a really confusing time. It is. So he got bullied um, a lot. And I didn't know whether to include this because I thought it was like a bit gratuitous, but he is kind of a piece of shit. So at school, they called him Dumbo and the FA Cup. But I kind of, <laughs> I kind of wanted to include it because I wanted to speak to you about what the FA Cup is. <laughs> Tell me, Talissa. I mean, I know, but tell our listeners. Okay. So, you know what Dumbo is, obviously. Yeah. And, like, I expect people in America, like, if they want to take the piss out of somebody with big ears, might call, kids might call each other Dumbo. Right. Like, like after, like, cartoon elephant. And the FA Cup is basically... Oh, people are going to write in again. But, like... <laughs> I, don't know what the FA, I don't know what the fucking FA stands for. Like, oh, foot... Right, I'm going to say Football Association. Right. And I... I bet there's some men like prolapsing at home over that. But like, <laughs> so it's the FA Cup. It's basically a trophy that has really big handles. Yes. So I think they're basically saying that his his ears are like handles. Yeah. So he did not, he didn't cope with this well. And uh, at school, he was involved in a couple of violent incidents. Um, but apparently his classmates said that none of them suggested that he would become a murderer. And that's all I could find. So I don't know exactly what these like violent incidents in quotation marks were. Right. He was in the lowest sets of each each class, which I don't know if you have that in America, but yeah, you're yeah you're sorted into like your ability. Right. So it's appropriate for what you're able to do. So some people can learn faster, and some people can go at their own pace. Right. So he was in the lowest sets, and classmates recalled that when somebody asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, he said a murderer. What? And they're like, but none of us suggested that he would become a murderer. He suggested he would become a murderer. Yeah. If you <laughs> he have, suggested if it himself. You, if you don't notice within my body language or my <laughs> just general demeanor, I am actually telling you. Yeah. I mean, fucking hell. But I mean, kids say a lot of shit. So yeah. in his final assembly of the year, he also threateningly remarked that he would commit a Columbine-style massacre in the final assembly, but with a knife, starting with the headmaster. So the headmaster is basically the principal. Yeah. Yeah, we, we call it the headmaster. His classmates brushed this off as idle threat. Again, I think somebody should have been paying attention, maybe. Like, we had angry kids at school who would, like, throw chairs and stuff. I'm like, I'm not sure where they are right now, but if I Googled it, I think they might be like they might be in prison. <laughs> but also, <laughs> like, when you're 15 as well, like, you do really say really horrible things as joking to your friends, especially boys. Oh my god, yeah. Like, I even when I think back, some like some of the stuff I've screamed at my brother in a rage. I've said to him, "I wish you were dead." Yeah, before, definitely. Yeah. And then if he died after that, I would just tr- I would truly be a suspect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, 15-year-olds do say stupid shit. Right. But another thing that kicked off uh, his sort of spiralling was at age 13, his grandmother died. Mm. And this really changed him because they were close to, and she would she would come for him after he was being bullied. So after that, he started becoming more violent. And one of the violent incidents he was involved in was that he was targeted on a local housing estate by a group of youths. This was taken from a newspaper, so I think that's why they're calling them youths. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he pulls out a knife on them. So he's, like, starting to carry a knife around, basically. Mm-hmm. He was also convicted of, of criminal damage of a house in 2013, which is a year before the murders. And in that same year, he committed a robbery at the local shop, and all he stole was just some cigars. Okay. But he did it, but he did it by knife point. So, How weird because, would that I guess, be like, if you were the, the shop worker and you're like, oh, all right, I'll give you what you want, like expecting they want, you know, cash. You're, like getting, the, you're getting the fucking 50s out of the till. He's like, no, 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 just some cigars, thanks. 
<laughs> just some swisher sweets i don't know if you have you them imagine? there swisher sweet or something like a twizzler <laughs> no it's a it, it's a cigar it's a type of cigar but they're like sweet flavored they have caramel cremes here i think yeah like here they have mini like, cigars in a tin right here they have like blueberry flavor so you really do if you want to like get them when you're in your 20s your early 20s that's what then you, you would gotta get. rob someone yeah <laughs> then you gotta get your knife out basically if you want some what are they called swisher sweets swisher sweets yeah. i i'm gonna look those up they sound fucking magical i might have some next time we come yeah to america so uh, sample the local delicacies <laughs> <laughs> the thing is about him like with that, he wasn't given a custodial sentence over the knife point robbery. He didn't try and hide his identity. Like, he just did it really blatantly. Mm. But he was sentenced to a year's supervision. This meant that he was on the police's radar and he was interviewed as part of the inquiries into Jim's stabbing in Castle Park. But his mother gave him an alibi and said she believed that he was home the whole time in his room. So he was cleared and then he remained at large for another year. And in the documentary that I was watching a bloke said that no one believed that his mum purposely lied for him because he'd snuck out of a window and then snuck back in without her knowing. Oh. So she genuinely thought he was in. Classic like she, teenager she, shit. Yeah, I mean, who isn't sneaking out of a window? Right. Like, when they're a teenager. But um, so, wait, so he was found, he was the one found in the bushes with gloves on, just st- staring creepily under a bridge. They arrested yep. him. But yep. because he had an alibi then he just got to go home? No. So because of the knife point robbery, he was... Oh, yeah, knife it, point. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah, so because of the knife point robbery, he was interviewed as part of, like, the 70 people that were interviewed um, about Jim's murder. Right. But his mum gave him an alibi, so they just cleared him off that list. Okay, okay, I get it and, now. And then, he, yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. And then he went on to murder Nahid. Mm-hmm. And then a year later, a woman saw him hiding under a bridge being really fucking creepy. Okay. Gotcha. And reported him. So he was completely known to the police. Right. But because he was 15 and his mum gave him an alibi, they were just like, well, it probably isn't this guy. Right. So his defense lawyer said that he, and this is his defense lawyer on the documentary talking about him, um, said he was chillingly emotionless when he was describing the murders. And on the same day he confessed, they charged him with both murders and the press got wind that the perpetrator was only 15 years old and nobody could believe it was just a boy. Mm. Because if you recall, it was like 102 stab wounds and um, in the eyes, which is like, oh, don't get me started on the eyes. When police searched his home, they discovered violent porn, 18 rated games and 18 rated horror films. So that's basically rated R in America. Like, but also basically you, any teenage boy. Yeah, like I, uh, do you know what? This is the kind of thing that. Oh, also, it said he had a collection of knives. Well, I'm sure my brother would have had a collection of knives, and my mum would have let him. Yeah. Like, yeah, and apparently he had books on and films on Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, and serial killers in general. Same. <laughs> And according to the police, he spent a lot of time alone and unsupervised by his parents. So he was able to indulge in whatever he wanted. For example, there be there wasn't any parental lock on the internet, so he could watch a lot of violent porn. Okay. But, okay, like the violent porn, I will definitely give you. Yeah. It can. I think that's a worrying sign. But that might just be because I like don't have an interest in like S and M or whatever. Right. Whereas like some people might say, "Oh, I have an interest in S and M. It doesn't make me a murderer." Yeah, like, and it's also like, not it's not particularly violent. It's just I mean, they're not cutting their heads off. Right. It's just a very aggressive and I don't want to say anti feminist because that's not true, but it can sometimes be interpreted as misogynistic. Yeah. It depends, I guess. Yeah. I mean violent porn, like if I found out that my boyfriend really liked violent porn, I wouldn't be rubbing my hands together being like, Oh great. Right. Like it would worry me a little. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, I know men watch gross porn. <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday. But... <laughs> what? <laughs> they did a what? <laughs> but, you know, 18 rated games like Call of Duty, Doom, like all that kind of stuff. Like, my brother's played those all the time. Yeah. 
and like 18 rated horror films i watched those when i was like 10 because like my mum would leave my brothers babysitting me and they'd be like well we want to watch a river runs through it and if you don't then go to sleep (laughs) (laughs) i was like okay i will watch it with one eye open (laughs) oh i wasn't allowed to do that at all if i had done that i would have got in so much trouble oh really yeah i actually your parents your parents kept a tight ship they did, but also I was the oldest, and whenever I had to babysit, it would be like I would get told on if something like that happened, you know? I didn't even think of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was kind of like a mutual agreement because they were like, we're going to watch this film that's absolutely petrifying, but you get to stay up. Right. So, yeah. like, those were the condi- It was a very, like, uh, you scratch my back, I scratch yours deal. <laughs> Yeah, and um, people say it affected me, and clearly it doesn't because I have no interest in serial killers or violence. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he is tried at the Old Bailey the following January, and his name is not disclosed to the public for reasons of age. He denied two charges of murder and possessing an illegal weapon, but he admitted to two charges of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility possessing an illegal weapon which he denied he did definitely because he couldn't have done the manslaughter without the illegal weapon right because it's like a it's a bayonet knife and you can't have a knife longer than five inches i think or three i can't remember the size but there's a there's a limit on the legal length of a knife that you can carry um in england and anything bigger than that and then the police will confiscate it off you so I mean, he's kind of. I think he's trying to make himself sound a bit more crazy by admitting to one and not the other. Yeah, I don't fucking know. I'm sure his but... lawyers were telling him to. They were really like concentrating they on that plan. part. So he was in custody before his trial, uh, and his trial was held in Guildford Crown Court because he was too dangerous to bail. And even though he had confessed, he hadn't pleaded guilty to some of the charges, as his defence was an insanity one. So the trial lasted two weeks. He said he couldn't be accountable for his actions. And they focused on the fact that he was hearing voices and he was diagnosed with autism just a short time before the trial. So basically, he'd always had autism. It just never been diagnosed. Yeah, but that doesn't make you a murderer. Exactly. Like, yeah, this will come up in a bit. So the defense used this to explain his lack of eye contact, his detached nature and his obsessive behaviors and for the reason that he was fixated on violent pornography, serial killers and murder, because they tried to use the argument that autistic people get obsessed with certain things. And a lot of the time that can be completely harmless, like, I don't know, magic or reading Japanese comics or something like that. But they were like, well, it's just his uh, autism has decided to fixate on violent pornography, serial killers and murder. So everyone at the trial accepted that he probably was autistic, but that that was irrelevant. Right. So the next, they focus on the psychosis that he claims to have. James had been seen by three psychiatrists on the defence side who all agreed that he was genuinely hearing voices. However, the one prosecution psychiatrist made the point that the murders were all well planned. He was wearing gloves as he was aware his fingerprints were already on the database for previous crimes. He hid. He snuck out of his bedroom late so his parents thought he was still in and could be an alibi for him. Um, So there's like a lot of planning around this. And basically in England, if you plead insanity, I think I've said this before in the podcast, but the definition of insanity in England and Wales is that you would still commit the crime if a police officer was standing right next to you, which he obviously wouldn't have done. Yeah. Because he wore gloves, he ran away, he he snuck out. Um, hiding under a bridge hiding under a bridge like a fucking really creepy troll and so he had an obsession with peter sutcliffe um some people said that that was his hero so peter sutcliffe is the yorkshire ripper who also would stab people in the eyes and would stab people feverishly Mm. and he also peter sutcliffe also used the defense that he was hearing voices in his head that told him to kill women so basically, police made a connection and thought that he came up with the idea that voice that he had voices in his head telling him to do the murders shortly before he was caught. Because during the trial, he was Googling on his phone things like, what can a murderer use as a defense? What? Yeah. And also, they, they brought up the fact that when he was arrested for the shop robbery, he never mentioned hearing voices. But later, he claimed the voices had started long before the shop robbery. If he was hearing voices, they argue that he would have been hearing them like, 
when he did when he did all his violent acts yeah he probably which, would have mentioned it earlier yes is what they're trying to say which i don't know like psychosis can come in and out but i think there is a real get out saying like i had voices in my head telling me to do it yeah. when yeah. if that if that was seriously true like you would do it no matter who was around right and also i, I keep I going know. back to the fact that him in school saying oh what do you want to be when you grow up a murderer it's like yeah it's like really with the voices saying, talking to you then yeah you're not really saying oh it's because the voices are telling me and i feel like if you were in school and you had voices telling you to do something i think your classmates or your teachers would kind of notice that like i'm so petrified to have kids in case they turn out like this <laughs> Yeah, ultimately, the jury found him unanimously guilty on the 22nd of April, 2016. And this was three months before his 18th birthday. Uh, he was to be sentenced a week later, and he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. It was later found out that he had newspaper cuttings. They were collections about the crimes that he had committed, and he would revisit them regularly. And the judge commented that he was obsessed with serial killers and Peter Sutcliffe, that had also stabbed the eyes of his victims. Sentencing him, Mr. Justice Spencer described the attacks as brutal, relentless, and cowardly. He added, you are well aware of the publicity this first murder attracted, and I have no doubt you relished the sense of power and control that it gave you. In September 2016, he tried to appeal against his 27-year sentence and obviously lost the map, like lost that motherfucker. He only had so... 27 years, though. That is not very long. No, it isn't. But the thing is, in England, like, a life sentence is, like, about 25 years. And also, he would, it, it, they have to take into account his age at the time of the murder. They take into account that he he pled guilty for manslaughter, but I guess they found him guilty of murder. But, yeah, it's his age, basically, that, that got him that really light sentence, I think. Yeah, but if he were getting out 25 years later, or 27 or whatever... He'd be getting out in his 40s, which is, I feel like is you still have time to have a life and maybe do more wrong. It's not like you're getting out of jail when you're 75 and you've lost your mobility and can't do anything anymore, you know? Yeah. That's what I, I mean, mean, I like, like to it's think... Not, I, I feel like 25 is short for a young person because... But also, I guess I mean... he's 15, so he could change. Like, I'm different from who I was when I was 15. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, God. <laughs> well, Jim's Jim's sister also commented that she believes if he'd received a harsher sentence for the shop robbery, that he may not have been out to murder her brother. And it's like, yes, definitely timing wise, but he would have murdered someone else. Yeah. Like he might that might have saved your brother, but it wouldn't have saved people in general. Not that that's right. You know, not that that's right or wrong, but like he was going to murder someone. That was just what he wanted to do. Yeah, you couldn't so, avoid it. You couldn't avoid it. Yeah, so the last line of my story is, he will be in his 40s before he is even considered for parole. All right. Which you don't think is good enough, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Now that I think about it, because I was, I binged on the DC Sniper podcast. Yeah, yeah. And there were two of them, and one of them was 17. So, and he was kind of being cajoled by the other guy a bit, wasn't he? Like, it, groomed. Yeah, exactly. And there's a huge debate right now because he might be up for parole in a couple of years, I think. They'll have to give him a new identity and stuff, surely, to let him out. Like, right, but they don't even... That's what the huge debate is, is should he be let out because he was basically brainwashed? Or was he actually brainwashed? Did he already have this in him his whole life? Yeah. And the other I man just, just brought uh, it out of him. I just feel like when you're when you're 17, like, oh my god! So me and Carly have really got into watching Teen Mum UK. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever watched Teen Mo Teen Mom? Yes, I have. Yeah, and it's I just love watching it because I just remember when I was that age and the boys that I could have had a baby with and how fucking awful they would be and stuff. Yeah. And like, it's just like it's so it's such good watching and you just the decisions they make are. Like, the girls are kind of sensible, but, like, a little bit scatty. Like, the girls will be a bit like, 
oh my god he's gonna cheat on me or like um i don't want him going out or like stuff like that right the boys just do the most stupid stuff i've ever seen like one guy his his girlfriend was annoyed with him for sleeping with her best friend in the back of their car (laughs) on a night out oh my god so he bought so he bought her a horse to say sorry what (laughs) the horse was 120 pounds and which is fucking cheap for a horse yeah (laughs) must have been a shit horse (laughs) well like it was pregnant no (laughs) and she was like i think this horse is pregnant like we have to get rid of it (laughs) like it wasn't even in a stable it was like in their back garden it was just like in a lean-to shed they made poor horse oh my goodness i know (laughs) this poor fucker of a horse has just got bought by some 17 year old absolute fuckwit Oh my god, it's uh, Rachel is such good watching. Yeah. They have like <laughs> now they, here they have um Teen Moms OGs or something. So it's like Teen Moms was started like probably like 10 or 15 years ago. So now they're around like our original age. gangster. Yeah. Like they're like <laughs> the <laughs> yes. Like the, they're just the original Teen Moms, but now they're all Oh my god. our age, I think. So But that's what I'm thinking like I want to see what happens like in the future, I want to see how they get on. Do they? Because I just think, obviously, they're all going to break up. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, every single one. Yeah, <laughs> all the guys going to cheat on them. Like I know people who have been together since I was, um, since they were at school. So they've been together since they were like fourteen. Yeah. Um, they Same. probably won't listen. They probably won't listen to this, and I won't name them. And I just think one of you must have cheated on the other. You simply must have, because like you're not a fucking Mormon. Like you're... yeah, once you've hit, hit twenty five and you've seen all your friends have different have relationships, a thousand boyfriends, and, yeah, and and you've had the same guy. Unless you you are co- a complete romantic and will love this person <sighs> forever, which I think is happens, but it's extremely rare. Everyone else, they fuck your best friend in your car and then they buy your horse. Like yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Come and on. you're pregnant. I'm trying to think what other stupid things they did that were really good. I think it was the same boy as well. Like <laughs> they were saying they lived in a caravan and they were saying that they couldn't afford like a new caravan. So the mum and dad gave them the deposit for a new caravan, even though they hate the what they hate the boy yeah. because he cheated on the girl. So they're like, You're a little shit, but we want her to live in a nice caravan at least. Yeah. So they gave them like the deposit money so they could get a new caravan. And then um, he just, like, pulls up outside her parents' house and is like, beep, beep. And he's, like, bought a BMW on, like, finance. No! <laughs> like, you prick. <laughs> Who does this kid think he is? He buys a pregnant horse for his girlfriend. <laughs> and he buys a BMW to drive up to the caravan that they now live in. He was honestly like, beep, beep, like, so proud of himself. <laughs> How has her stepdad not knocked this kid out? Right. <laughs> and her stepdad was called Big Mike. Like, it was just the whole show. Is so She's the best thing about it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is why uh, it's scary to have kids, because you either have a daughter and you're terrified for her for her whole life, or... You're, like, slipping birth control pills into her fucking cereal every morning. <laughs> Or you have a son who's just a complete idiot from age 10 to 20 or beyond. Oh, who, who likes to burn your house stuff. and beeps at you. <laughs> <laughs> have I ever told you? My brother was like, so you know that sound when you throw a brick into a TV? And I was like, yeah, but no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, like, I know my- what you're talking about. What? Oh yeah, and then his mate Nathan, who was sat next to us, was like, "Yeah, <laughs> like, car- like carry on." <laughs> That's the difference between like teenage boys and teenage girls. I would never spend my afternoon throwing bricks into an old TV in the woods. Like that's not my idea of fun. Yeah, <laughs> at fourteen. Maybe now, maybe as a thirty-three-year-old angry woman, now I would do that. Oh, I would fucking wreck a TV, <laughs> give him half a chance. Has anyone got a spare? Oh my god, did I tell you? Sorry, this is so we keep cracking on, don't we? But did I tell you that during um lockdown, my boyfriend broke my TV? Yes. How did he break it though? 
Oh, so it's on like a chest of drawers. He opened the drawer and the TV just fell forward and smashed. <laughs> like, I've had it for three years. And he was like, God, that is really unstable. I was just like, is it? <laughs> That's your fault, Alyssa. Yeah. And then he was like, I've never broken a TV in my life. I was like, well, neither have I. <laughs> he was like, I know loads of people that have. And I was like, do you? Because I don't know one. Teenage <laughs> boys. Of you. Yeah. You and my brother. <laughs> And at least he had the courtesy to do it to an abandoned TV in the middle of the woods. <laughs> okay, so let me hear your story, Rach. Yes. I'm, I love like I love that we don't tell each other. I know, me too. It is on Small Town Murder and on other podcasts, I've heard them say, like, they did a show that they did at a live show. Mm. But, like, as they're doing it, they're like, oh, no. And I'm like, why are you reacting like that? You've already heard it. Right. Which I found a little bit annoying. I yeah. felt like I was being done over. Yeah. Oh, do you remember when we did this at a live show? And I'm like, what? You've already done it. Yeah. Like, that's not as fun. Right. It's, anyway. it's like a lie. <laughs> <laughs> By a free podcast that I don't pay for. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a lie. Once I gave them like 10 quid. Oh, that's nice. Um, because they read out your name at the end. Yeah. And obviously I've got a really hard name. <laughs> so like they, they, I just like, I heard them fuck my name up and it was really funny. <laughs> which episode so was, was it I'm, i want to listen to it do you know i will find out because my friend messaged me going oh i've just heard the episode i've just heard them try and read your name out at the end of an episode uh, and it, i think it was like epi- i think it's episode 67 or something but i'll find out a message you yeah. yeah okay cool all right let's get into my story about yes a young person who supposedly caused murder caused supposedly murder? Uh, is it really hot there too yes <laughs> i'm fucking boiling i can't put my fan on because it's so shit and old i know really I, I, have, I always have to turn my uh fan off because it'll be too noisy i mean the heat coming off this laptop <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yeah anyway go on okay carol ann fugate i don't know if it's fugate or fugate i'm gonna say fugate it's f-u-g-a-t-e i think you're right okay Carol Ann Fugate was born in July of 1943 in Lincoln, Nebraska, to parents William Fugate and Velda Bartlett. Do you know where? Velda? Yeah. She had one older sister, Barbara. Also, do you know where uh, Nebraska is? Is it? Okay, so I know where Alaska is. Is it like the opposite side of the country to that? No. Is it Canada? No. <laughs> Am I a fucking idiot? <laughs> You're completely wrong. Sorry. Okay. You're like, I'm avoiding the idiot question. You're just wrong. <laughs> um, okay, tell me, because I don't know, clearly. Nebraska is right in the middle of the country. I would... It sounds cold. It is cold in the winter. Okay, fair enough. It's uh, completely flat, very boring. Sorry if anyone's from Nebraska. Um, Nebraska hate mail. Incoming. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one person. Um, when we moved from Minnesota to Los Angeles, we had to drive through Nebraska and it was like time froze because it was just one (laughs) straight long road, fields, daytime. It was like there, nothing changed. There was no scenery. There was nothing until we got to Lake Ogallala, Nebraska, which was very nice. It was a big lake in the middle of nowhere. I shall Google it. Yeah. Anyways, Carol Ann Fugate is from Nebraska. Her mother later married Marion Bartlett, and they had a daughter, Betty Jean. Carol was like, I think, 13 years older than Betty Jean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Growing up, Carol had a rebellious streak and a bad temper. She was not the most academic, and she had failed a grade in elementary school. I don't know how hard that is to fail in elementary school. You know, it's probably pretty. You know, I think she probably was just a little shit. Yeah. And like they were like, just get out of my classroom like, yeah. every time. Yeah. So she didn't learn anything because of that. Not because of the fact that she was stupid. Yeah. They are. Uh, her family also came from a pretty low. They're they're pretty low class. Like their home was squalid. Yeah. So I know really what like she was word. dealing with at home. Squalor. Yeah. <laughs> In 1956, when Carol was just 13, Carol's older sister Barbara began dating a guy called Bob Von Bush. Why were names so much better back then? (laughs) I know. (laughs) One of Bob's close friends, Charlie Starkweather, eventually became interested in Carol. 
He was 18. She was 13. Is that okay? In, that's probably okay in the 50s. In the 50s. In Nebraska. Possibly. Yeah, I think a it lot was of still shit. Maybe a little bit like, uh... Let's not leave them alone together. Yeah. Like, you can, you can be chaperoned. Yeah. So the four of them double dated on a steady basis despite Carol's youth. So Carol, her sister Barbara, Bob, and Charlie. A little bit about Charlie Starkweather. Does his name ring a bell at all? Hmm. No. Okay. Why? <laughs> You're so mysterious. <laughs> like, you fucking love it. <laughs> I, d- I like building up. I like building the mystery. That's part of the fun. <laughs> For you. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Starkweather. Also, in this story, I, I centered it around Carol because she was only 13 when this all started, but... There isn't a lot about her, and I think it's because she was so young when this happened. There is a lot about Charlie Starkweather because he was 18 and he was obviously an adult. Yeah, and he's like got a job and friends and a social life and evidence of his living. Right. Other than being being in school. Right. So, Charlie Starkweather was born into a poor, uneducated, but hardworking family in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1938. He was the third of seven children... While his early family life was fairly pleasant and normal, his school experiences were traumatic for him. Children laughed at his minor speech impediment and teased him about his bowed legs. He was extremely... Oh, no. Bowed legs. Yeah. What was the speech impediment? Do you know? I'm not sure. And it was probably very minor. I don't think it was... Because he was was still understandable, you find out later, but... Um, yeah, it might have just been like, you know, when you're growing up and maybe you just have a lisp or something for a while. Yeah, he was extremely nearsighted, which was undiagnosed until he was a teen year, teenager. So while in school, he was considered a slow learner. So kind of similar That's to so Carol. harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Like all he needed was glasses. <laughs> right. He was also like really good in gym. So uh, he fuck that. Yeah, I don't, I don't need glasses. I'll just beat your face in. <laughs> right. That's exactly what he was like. At 18, he dropped out of Lincoln High School and was working at a Western Union newspaper warehouse. He sought employment there because the warehouse was located near Whittier Junior High School, where Fugate was a student, which is a little creepy. It's like this 18-year-old coming by, seeing a 13-year-old every day after school. (laughs) Yeah, but didn't you have that when you were at school? I did, and I I was thinking about that when I was researching the story, just... There were a couple of girls who dated older guys and... The girls with the biggest tits went out with guys who had cars. That was just the rule. <laughs> like... <laughs> but it wasn't... And it's it was so still, creepy. It, yeah, it was still kind of weird, but it was... I think when you're that age, it's like, oh, it's mysterious and, oh, she's so cool because she has an older boyfriend who can drive places, you know? Yeah, and you don't realize that they're only going out with you because girls of their own age don't want to go out with that fucking yeah. loser or take or take their shit. Exactly. Because they are usually, like, controlling or have, like, you know, issues that mean that they feel inferior, so they want to go out with somebody they can feel superior to. Yes. Rather than somebody their own age. Yes. Like, and you realize all of this when you are 30. <laughs> <laughs> when you're 18, you're like, he's got a car, you're just jealous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Given his working schedule, Starkweather began to visit Fugate every day after school. He was considered a poor worker. His employer later recalled, sometimes you'd have to tell him something two or three times. Of all the employees in the warehouse, he was the dumbest man we had. <laughs> Absolutely slammed. <laughs> you didn't need to add the end bit. <laughs> I know. I had to tell him two or three times would have been enough. (laughs) (laughs) Then he's like, dumb fuck. (laughs) Starkweather taught Fugate how to drive. One day she crashed his 1949 Ford into another car. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) However, Starkweather's father paid the damages but argued with his son about it. Obviously, like, understandable. Yeah. His father banished Starkweather from the family home because uh, he refused to condone his son's behavior. The young man quit his job at the warehouse and became a garbage collector at minimum wage. Well, how much was the warehouse paying? Maybe a little bit better. I don't know. (laughs) I thought garbage men got paid quite well. Maybe they do, but 
you got to sit outside all day. I don't know. I don't really know, but I guess the minimum wage part was uh important because he started to he started developing a nihilistic worldview, believing that his current situation was the the final determinant of how he would live the rest of his life. He used his time on the garbage route to begin plotting bank robberies because he also Not a baby. He, he went into like wealthy neighborhoods and did the garbage there, so he started just yeah. looking at all the houses and he was jealous and he settled Getting on, ideas. Yeah. He settled on a personal philosophy by which he lived the remainder of his time, which was dead people are all on the same level. So I think he just had like I, a chip on his shoulder of being poor and working in a rich neighborhood. I don't understand what you mean by dead people are on the same level. Well, like he's just like you you can't be rich when you're dead. Yeah, like there's no class. There's no class levels when you're dead. Anyone can be killed, right. rich or poor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I get it. So, Charlie and Carol were similar in a lot of ways. They weren't very academic, they had hot tempers, and they didn't get along with their parents. Even though Carol's teachers considered her a slow learner, Charlie thought she was a wizard. She was impressed by his cars, his toughness, his looks, and despite his poverty, the way he could give her almost anything she wanted. He also would, like go and steal things whenever you know he'd go into a gas station and steal a pack of cigarettes if he could and he would give it to carol to impress her that would impress me when i was 13 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true it's like ooh, exciting one i can't buy these myself two even if i had the money i couldn't buy them myself <laughs> so like also for the free <laughs> what's that peep show <laughs> quote where he's like the secret ingredient oh, the secret ingredient is crime, is crime. <laughs> That makes, like, the chocolate bar more delicious, yeah. yeah. So good. <laughs> uh, Charlie said that Carol meant more to him than anything had before. Without her, he would be thrust back into the world he hated so much. So, now that the relationship with his parents was very strained, Carol became the center of Charlie's life. He began telling people that he and Carol were getting married. Then he started telling his friends that Carol was pregnant with his child, a lie that backfired when Carol's parents heard it. Why would you lie about that? I think he just wanted complete possession of her. In those days, if you're pregnant, they'd be like, why aren't you fucking married like right now? Yeah, well, he wanted well. to, but maybe it's just like, yeah, I made her pregnant. She's having my baby. You know, everything is like my, 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 me, me, me. Yeah. That's what it seems like. Also, like, I think like in some states, isn't it that you can get married at 15 or whatever, but you have to have your parents' permission? Yeah, especially back then you could. So my mum got married when she was 16. Really? And she had to have my and she had to have my nan's permission. Wow. To your dad, who yeah. she's now divorced from. Nope, not to my dad. Oh. One before that. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Who she is also divorced from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like my older brother, my eldest brother, Ben. Right. He was the result of that marriage, and they got married when they were both 16. Yeah. And then she moved to Belize with him because he was in the army. Whoa. I didn't know it, that. She moved to South America. I know. She like lived in South America for, like, fucking ages. Wow. And then she had my brother, Ben, and then she... My nan was like, I'll sign this wedding certificate, but you are going to be home in two years. I fucking swear by it. And my mom was like, no, I'm not. You're going to see. <laughs> and then two years later, she was like, can I come home? <laughs> Yeah. Just like every 16 year old, like, no, you don't know. You don't, you just want to crush me. You don't want me to be a free spirit. <laughs> right. My nan, my nan was like, fine, fuck off to Belize. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll see you when the fucking food runs out. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, it is. And she doesn't think it's interesting at all. My mum's like, yeah, I was, I was all right. Yeah. I was like, did you have, I was like, where did you live? She was like, in like a hut on like sticks. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I think I understand yeah. that though, because like people are like that to me when I tell them that I I lived in Ireland and you know I I went to high school there and they're like oh that's really cool and I'm just like yeah just because it wasn't a happy time for me and I was a, a miserable teenager like same as your mom <laughs> you know yeah it was like was it like Komodo dragon it was like no I was just literally sit there and wait for my drunk husband to come home <laughs> and then I would like put him to bed and then I'd be like oh there's a Komodo dragon fucking yeah. great yeah. <laughs> I wish I was at home. <laughs> cool. Yeah, same. It's so. like, oh, yeah, Ireland. Yeah, there were castles there. We live by a castle. All right, bye. Yeah. Um, all right, anyways. I was, babys I was babysitting nonstop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
on January 21st, 1958. So he's telling people that Carol is pregnant. Carol had gained a little bit of weight. So her parents were like, what's going on? You're 14. You're 13, 14. Like, uh, who is this guy? You know. So on January 21st, 1958, Starkweather visited Fugate at her home in the Belmont neighborhood of Lincoln. Belmont Belmont was very, uh, not a great neighborhood. Not finding her at home, he argued with Fugate's parents, Velda and Marion, or Marion Bartlett, who told him to stay away from their daughter. Starkweather then fatally shot the Bartlett's with a shotgun and proceeded to strangle and fatally stab their two-year-old daughter, Betty Jean. Jesus wept. That's a bit much. Yeah. And it was like, Later on, when they caught him, sorry, that gives it away, but when they caught him, he just kept, he would always make up stories of how, like, the mom hit him and the dad threatened them and he didn't actually go over there to murder them, but he went there to do a peace offering and he brought his gun because he told the dad that he wanted to go hunting with him and just a bunch of bullshit. Whatever, whatever it is, strangling a two-year-old. Yeah. Like, you had no beef with that two-year-old. Right. He said so... that she was crying, so... Well, what, like, she was going to give the game away? <laughs> right. I think it just goes back to that other story that I did about the, what was it, the honeymoon, or the heartbreak killers? The... Yeah, that was the honeymoon, the honeymoon killers, yeah, where they, they just got, I think they just got rid of the baby because, like, it was just a pain. Yeah, I think them. it's the same thing. People like I yeah. feel like psychopaths like this can't deal with babies. Yeah, like even if it was a dog, they would have just killed the dog, like or the cat, or well, <laughs> oh, just for you wait, fuck's sake. Alyssa. Sorry. No. Yeah. When Fugate arrived at home, he told her of his recent actions, and they hid the bodies in various locations behind the house. The couple remained in the house for six days, turning people away <gasps> with a note written by Fugate taped to the door that said stay away everybody sick with the flu also she spelt flu f-l-u-e <laughs> why that's so funny i know i that's why i kept out like maybe like, that's why? how they spelt it in the 50s or maybe that was a 14 year old's way of thinking i know how to spell the flu like my mother would spell the flu i think it's funny because like they're like rubbing their hands together like this is the perfect plan yeah. but it's just like <laughs> that's why it's funny i think <laughs> yeah so she signed the, the note as her mother velda like you would fake a note to get out of gym yeah like... or when you failed your math test and your parents had to sign it like i had i definitely forged my dad's name i'm telling your dad <laughs> He had a really easy signature. It was it was very Four. clear. <laughs> anyway, so she wrote that note, stay away, everybody is sick with the flu, put it on the door. Several people tried to visit and called the police, including Carol's sister Barbara and her now husband Bob. They were turned away. Other people tried to visit. Barbara tried to send like her and Carol's mutual friend to go see what was going on. Every time everyone would get a different story told. They even asked the police to go over there and Carol was very, like, charming and was like, oh, everyone's, you know, no one's home. Everyone's just gone. Who suspects her? Like, nobody suspects her. Right. Like, a 13-year-old girl comes to the door and says, nicely, oh, everyone's sick. I'm looking after them. You just go, okay, like, pat on the head. Bye. Yeah. You believe her, I think. Exactly. Especially if you don't know there's an 18-year-old lurking in the next room lurking (laughs) that's how i imagine it i just imagine them like sitting in the dark like one of the things that i read was like after they hid the bodies they just came inside and ate uh crisps and drank pepsi and hung out wow yeah and then i think that they were just like what do we do now oh i'll put a note on the door oh someone's at the door quick you go hide you know how you are when you're 13 you know yeah like (laughs) Yeah, at natural. Right. <laughs> Finally, yeah. Fugate's grandmother, Pansy, I kept her name in because I just like that name. Fucking yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Fugate's mother, Pansy, became suspicious after trying to see the family. She specifically wanted to see her daughter, so uh, Carol's mom. And she was yeah. turned away by Carol. Grandmas can sniff a rat. Yes, especially in their own granddaughters. Yes. 
<laughs> she's like, you lying little bitch, get out of my way. <laughs> And contact, she contacted the Lincoln, Lincoln Police Department. When police arrived on January 27th, Starkweather and Fugate had fled the house. The police were satisfied, though. There seemed like there was no sign of disorder. The house was quiet, so they left. No, it's still there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just makes me laugh that they were like, shit, grandma's caught us. Whole ass. <laughs> Later that day, Bob Von Bush demanded that the police make a thorough search of the property, but they refused. I don't get why the the cops are being told multiple times by family members, please go into this house. It doesn't matter if someone's there. It doesn't matter if the door is closed. Just go inside. Because they know better. (laughs) They know best, okay? Better than Grandma. Better than Bob Von Bush. (laughs) Better than this fake note. (laughs) Meanwhile, Charlie's dad had been trying to get the police to pick up his son for questioning, but uh, the police also refused that. So, all on all sides. You're fucking busy in Nebraska. No. You are run run off your feet, are you? Right. Like, lazy. Yeah. Bob Von Bush and his brother went out to the Bartlett's house and searched the property on their own. One look inside the outhouse and the chicken coop confirmed their worst fears. So oh, no. the stepdad was uh, <laughs> just in the chicken coop. His body was in the chicken <gasps> coop and the mom was uh, put down a hole in the outhouse. Well, you shit. I think so. This time the police Ugh. paid him some attention. The police bulletin went out to pick up Charlie Starkweather and oh, Carol Fugate. Oh, for God's sake. This is what it takes. Yeah. <laughs> Literally corpses. Rotting corpses. Yes. Three of them. Now do you believe me? (laughs) Wouldn't you be so angry if you were any of those people who were like, I told you. I told you to go three days ago, you know? Oh, what are you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Starkweather and Fugate drove to the farmhouse of 70-year-old August Meyer, one of the family friends who lived in Bennett, Nebraska. It's not really clear, but Starkweather killed him with a shotgun blast to the head. It's not really clear why. That's four people he's killed now. That's four people. He also killed Meyer's dog. No! (laughs) I knew that was coming. (laughs) I need to hear more about the dog. (laughs) Oh, I think it's it's the same as the baby. Like, the dog was probably barking at Starkweather, and he was just like, Just being an inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah. As they were fleeing oh. the area, Starkweather and Fugate drove their car into the mud. So they went to they went to August Meyer's house to ask him if they could borrow his car and maybe to like lay low. I don't think they told him what happened, but he was kind of like, "What'd you guys do?" Yeah. No, I'm not going to help you. Anyways, so they stole his car. They drove their car into the mud and abandoned the vehicle, hiding their shotguns. They they are so shit at this. They really are. <laughs> Like, they are, it's just like fucking calamity after calamity. <laughs> so hiding their shotguns, the two of them hitched a ride from 17-year-old Robert Jensen and 16-year-old Carol King. Within moments, the shotgun was at Jensen's neck and Charlie was demanding for their money. He forced Jensen to drive back towards Myers' farm to an abandoned storm cellar where both were shot and killed. While all Fuck. of this was happening, Carol allegedly was sitting in the car. So that's been the story. There's been differing stories. For that incident, He's... Starkweather told people that Carol was jealous of the other girl, Carol King. And so she was the one who shot her. He's just a huge bullshit, basically. Yeah. They stole Jensen's car and they fled Bennett. And then they... <laughs> And then they drove that into a wall. Yeah. And then they stole someone else's car and drove well, it into a river. <laughs> yes, Talissa. Just wait. <laughs> the two drove into a wealthier section of Lincoln. This is where he had his garbage run and he knew mm-hmm. where the rich houses were. So he was like, we're going to go to the richest house and we're going to go steal from them and carry out my bank robbery plan. How about you haul ass <laughs> somewhere where someone, like where people don't know you? Oh, yeah. And also... uh during this whole thing up until the very end there were different parts where it's like and then they drove past their house which was really stupid because there were cops everywhere but they wanted to go back home and live there fucking thought process again 
I'm just going to buy her a horse and she'll forgive me for fucking her best friend in the back of the car. That is the thought process. And here's my fancy BMW. <laughs> yeah, beep beep. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually very similar to that. The two drove into the wealthier section of Lincoln, where they entered the home of industrialists C. Lauer and Clara Ward. Only Clara and her maid Lillian Fenkel were home. Fenkel? <laughs> Lillian Fenkel. Oh, sorry, I thought you said Lily and Fenkel. No. <laughs> like, like they had two. <laughs> Just, okay. just Lillian Fenkel. Right, yes, she's a maid. <laughs> Clara, along with one of their two dogs, was fatally stabbed. Oh my god. Too yeah. many dogs have died in this. <laughs> I know. She had two dogs too, and, and they were both very... One was named Queenie, and I can't remember no. the other one's name. Yeah, I know. And I bet it was something painfully cute like Queenie. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, they forced Lillian Fenkel to cook them breakfast, and soon after, she was stabbed to death. Oh. Yeah. I mean, this is a proper spree. Yeah. it. The, I also read that Lillian was partially deaf, so uh, Starkweather had to keep writing his demands on a note for her. Oh, my God. That's horrible. Yeah. I'm surprised he can write, though. But, yeah. <laughs> when Lauer returned home that evening, so the man of the house, Starkweather shot him as well. There was a big fight with him, but Starkweather ended up shooting him. Carol claims later that she was either in the car, in the home's library, or asleep during the murders. So she's claiming that she wasn't a part of any of this. This is like Rose West, yeah. like Fred and Rose West. Right. Like Fred basically took the blame for every single murder and said that Rose didn't have a clue. Yeah. But, like, one of the kids that was killed was killed while he was in prison. Mm. So they were like, well, it was clearly her. Yeah. So that's how, that's how they caught her out. But, like, yeah, he, he was basically just willing to take all the blame. Well, after a while, Charlie wasn't because he, he found out that she was saying, like, I wasn't a part of any of this. I was forced to do it, which was probably yeah. true. Uh, because he was a big bully kind of guy. But he thought she was going to stick by him. And, yeah, and when she didn't, then he started t saying like, oh, she did this and she was part of the stabbing of this person. And What do you think? I think she was 13. I think or she was 14 years old. I don't, I don't think that she was fully... She might have thought at first that things were cool and maybe when he killed her parents, then she was like, oh, great, my parents are gone. But I think once it started getting going... Then she was like, I'm in deep shit. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And she was probably too scared to get out of it. Yeah, I mean, once you've seen him stab, like, fucking a deaf maid, a dog, like, an old man. Yeah. And another 16-year-old girl, you'll be like, okay, well, he probably has no problem killing me. Yeah. So. Exactly. <laughs> keep, on, keep on his good side. All right, so they killed everyone in that home. They slept there. And then the next day... The two of them loaded the Ward's black 1956 Packard, which is a very fancy car, with food mm. and prepared to escape in style. They ransacked the house, taking everything that looked valuable. Again, choose a less conspicuous car. Yeah. So that goes on the serial killer bingo. Yes. Also, he was obsessed with James Dean, so he slicked his hair back exactly like James Dean. He wanted to drive cool cars. So I yeah. think that was a part of it. He he thought he was a, a rebel without a cause. The murders caused an uproar with Lancaster County. Obviously, the rich people murders are like, oh my God, they're- The worst. Yeah. <laughs> We've lost society's finest. The governor, who was a close friend of C. Lauer and Clara Ward, contacted the Nebraska National Guard and the Lincoln Chief okay. of Police called for block-by-block -block search of the city. So National Guard- Right now, we have the National Guard come in a couple of weeks ago because of the riots. Yeah. They're calling in the so National it, Guard for two teenagers. Is it like one below the army? Or is it the army? The National Guard is volunteers. Uh, Whoa. So it's like you go away and you do training, like in your state, and then say like, uh, I remember there was a couple, a person a couple of weeks ago and they were like, yeah, I worked at a grocery store and I'm a National Guard. So when they needed National Guards, I basically came home from my shift at the grocery store in L.A. and had to go back out and be a National Guard and stand on I the street. I don't think that's cool. Yeah. 
Like, I know they do training, but it can't be that much. I'm not really that sure. Biz- I don't know much about the training or anything, but... That's bizarre. Yeah, and, it, and like, you do get um, benefits from it. I think that they help you with school or something if you want to go to college or university, but uh, I'm not exactly sure. But, yeah, National Guard, it's, like, guns and tanks and basically yeah. there's one in each state. Wow, I'm going to look into that. That sounds really interesting and fucked up. Yeah. So they called the National Guard on two teenagers. By this time, they were all over the news. The FBI started an investigation. A $1,000 reward was offered by the mayor. Aircraft were sent up to help look for the ward's black Packard. So they're looking for this flashy car as well. They sent a helicopter or whatever to start looking for it driving around. Frequency. I mean, to be fair, they are pretty dangerous. Yeah. They just shoot whoever they come into contact with. Right. Or At this point. Yeah. I was going to say, it could just be Charlie, but yeah, both of them together, possibly too. Frequent sightings of the two were often reported, and people complained about the incompetence of the Lincoln Police Department for their inability to capture the two. No duh. It shouldn't be that hard, right. should it? Like, they've got a really conspicuous car. They're fucking kids, basically. Yeah. And they keep making stupid decisions, like driving past their house. Right. They're not like the mob. They're not like masterminds. Yeah, they're just stupid idiots. The two yeah. drove all night and crossed the border into Wyoming. Needing a new car, obviously, because of the high profile of their Packard, they found traveling shoe salesman Merle Collison sleeping in his Buick along the highway oh, outside God. of Douglas, Wyoming. Poor bastard. Yeah. <laughs> Starkweather tried to convince Collison to trade cars, but when Collison didn't agree fast enough, he was shot. Ugh. But the salesman's car had a push-pedal emergency brake, which was something new to Starkweather. While attempting to drive away, the car stalled. He tried to restart the engine, and a motorist, Joe Sprinkle, there's some am- amazing names in this story. I swear you made these up. <laughs> you just made them up for a laugh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just I just wrote all this last night. <laughs> You were like, I'm having trouble finishing off my story. And then you were like, Will, just think of some names. <laughs> no, give me some sprinkle. nouns. Yeah, give me some yeah. verbs and nouns. <laughs> okay. He tried to restart the engine and a motorist, Joe Sprinkle, stopped to offer aid. After Mr. Sprinkle helped the couple start the car, Starkweather threatened Mr. Sprinkle with a rifle. This time, his intended victim resisted and a struggle ensued. While the two yes, were... sprinkles. Yes. <laughs> also, I think I read somewhere that he was a geologist, a young geologist. Geology rocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While the two were fighting, a deputy sheriff arrived at the scene at that moment. Fugate ran to him. She ran out of the car, yelling something to the effect of, It's Starkweather. He's going to kill me. Also, wow. they, they also had the dead guy in the car the guy that they stole the car from oh was he like what's he called merv i think it was merle. something like that like he's merle yeah he's just trying to make a living I like know. it's like death of a salesman yeah like oh so his dead body was also in the car i think carol was like this is way too much now a cop is here I, <sighs> this is my chance that's enough corpses for one day yeah <laughs> like- so she's running to the cop. She's saying, it's Starkweather. He's going to kill me. In the excitement, Starkweather jumped into the car and sped away, leading Wyoming, law- Wyoming lawmen on a wild chase that at times reached 100 miles per hour through the streets of Douglas. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's mayhem. Soon after, lawmen got close to the fleeing vehicle and shot out the car's back window. Flying glass cut Starkweather around the face. Thinking he was bleeding to death, he abruptly stopped and surrendered. Converse County Idiot. Sheriff Earl Heflin <laughs> said he thought he was bleeding to death. That's why he stopped. That's the kind of yellow son of a bitch he is. <laughs> also, are you fucking stupid? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably just a couple of cuts. And considering he's like stabbed a dog, strangled a baby, shot someone in the face, stabbed someone to death, and then like a little bit of blood on his face, and he's like, Ugh. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I didn't read this anywhere, but I wonder if he was on drugs or anything at the time. Like it's it sounds very frenzied. Mm. But what drugs were like? Because like the only drugs I know that are popular during the fifties is like 
lewds for housewives. Yeah. Maybe like I cocaine guess coke, or something. Coke must have been around, yeah. but yeah. All right. So both Starkweather and Fugate were captured in Douglas. Carol maintained that she was a hostage throughout the entire ordeal and that she kept going with Charlie because she feared that he would kill her family if she didn't. The only problem with that story was that she admitted being present for all the Nebraska murders that included her parents and half-sister. So there's differing accounts of whether she was there when he killed the parents. Uh, Even Charlie said that she was maybe the one that killed the baby. Oh, God. Yeah. I but don't... she, I think she definitely wrote the note. Yeah. So she must have been there. Yeah. So she must have known that he had killed them. Um, and she answered the door to her grandma. So. Yeah, she knew that they had ki- that he had killed them. But his story is that she was there the whole time. And her story was she came home to find the dead bodies and helped him put oh, them away. Oh, I see. Still not cool. Yeah. Charlie and Carol were both charged with first-degree murder and murder while committing a robbery. Since both were being tried as adults, both faced the prospect of the electric chair. At 13? Yeah. The prosecution chose the murder of Robert Jensen on which to try them since it it had the most potential to shock and outrage the jury. I'm not really sure out of all of those why that one... Uh, was that the old man? No, he was the one when they killed the old man and then they drove their car into a ditch and then they got in the car with that young couple and then mm-hmm. killed them. So I think maybe of all the other ones, Charlie could say it was self-defense. But I think with Robert Jensen, because he was shot in the neck, it's just kind of a more proof that He wasn't even looking at you, basically. Right. Yeah. You got into his car. You shot him. During the trial, Starkweather later said that Carol was there the entire time, but she said that when she arrived home, Starkweather met her with a gun and said that her family was being held hostage. She said Starkweather told her that if she cooperated with him, her family would be safe. Otherwise, they would be killed. So she's... If I was 13 and facing the electric chair, I would be saying any old bullshit to get me out of whatever the fuck. Like, even when you're 13, you know what the electric chair is. Yes. I also think this is probably where being a girl comes into its own. <laughs> like, you, you could go, I, he made me. Yeah. Like, and you, and you are quite possibly going to get away with it. Like Lizzie, what's she called? Lizzie Borden. Yes. Yeah. Axed her family, clearly axed everyone to death. Yeah. And then was like, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, sweet girl, like, couldn't have possibly done it. Right. I believe it more with Carol, though, because she did come from a crappy background. And, and he is 18 and he's kind of a big bully. So I would understand it. He seems very controlling. Yeah. I mean, I don't think 18 year old boy, a 13 year old girl, obviously one has more life experience. Yes. And obviously one is able to physically and probably mentally control the other. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Starkweather, on the other hand, claimed Fugate was the most trigger-happy person he had ever met. So well, he's, he's coming liar, back. So... Yeah, he's just coming back with a bunch of bullshit. And it also, mm-hmm. it's like, maybe you handed her a gun and told her to shoot, and she was, you know, how terrified would you be? You're just like, okay, boop, 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 you know? Yeah, you just do it, yeah. yeah. The jury made its decision within 24 hours, guilty on both accounts of first-degree murder. The men and women of the jury specifically asked for the death penalty for Starkweather. Their request was granted June 25, 1959. At Carol's trial, the defense was built upon her being a hostage, forced by Starkweather to go with him on his murder spree. It was not a very credible defense, and she, like Charlie, was found guilty of murder on November 28, 1958. Oh my god, I can't believe that. So he went into the electric chair in 1959. She served a model prisoner, a nurse's aide, at the Women's Reformatory in York for 18 years when she received her parole and moved to Michigan. I think that was 19. Oh, so she was she was never given the death penalty. She was, but they took it away because she was so young. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So she got parole in the 70s, 18 years later. Yeah. She has always maintained I... that she had been an unwilling companion to Starkweather. She had stayed with him because he threatened to have her family killed if she tried to get away. 
Carol eventually married. In 2014, when she was 70 years old, her and her husband were in a one-car accident. Their car rolled off the freeway. Uh, Her Mm -hmm. husband was killed, and she was severely injured. In the book, The Twelfth Victim, covering the Starkweather case, in which the authors lay out the case that 14-year-old Carol Fugate was another innocent victim, the law let her down. Public opinion had been unjustly critical of the girl. They hope to right this wrong while Carol is still alive. So that's the story of Carol Ann Fugate. The Starkweather Fugate case inspired tons of films like The Sadist, Starkweather in 2004, Murder in the Heartland in 1993, and Natural Born Killers. Yeah, I, do you know what? For some like for some reason, I was gonna like chime in and then be like, "Are you talking about Bonnie and Clyde?" And then I was like, "Don't be stupid. Their names were Bonnie and Clyde." <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's familiar though, isn't it? Have you seen Natural Born Killers? Uh, all I can remember about Natural Born Killers is does somebody les off in a pool? No, I know what, what movie you're thinking, thinking of. of. <laughs> That's like somebody. There's a lesbian scene in a pool, and like when we were teenagers, like cracks on about it. And that's not natural born killers, is it? No, that's um wild things. Really? Yes. Okay, my brain is. Maybe this was one of the films my brothers watched while I was like half asleep, and it's just like infiltrated my brain. <laughs> Probably, but that does kind of have a similar title, like natural born killers, wild things. I could see how those get mixed up. Yeah. Um, um, but no, Natural Born Killers has Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis. Juliette Lewis is a bit weird, isn't she? Isn't she like a Scientologist? She I think she's a, she, yeah, I think she's a Scientologist. I went down a Scientology hole really hard. Do you remember <laughs> when our mutual friend broke up with me and I was like in bed, like drinking red wine and eating pepper armies and just watching Going Clear? <laughs> I didn't like, know that. I didn't know it was like that time. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I didn't know you very well at that time because I hadn't visited yeah. you yet. So I was just, uh, I wasn't letting you know that I was drinking red wine mid afternoon and watching that in bed <laughs> because I was like so depressed being broken up with. Oh. But I was just texting you, going, "Is it okay if I still come and see you?" And you're like, "Yeah, sure it is." And I was just yeah. like, "Hope I remember this tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> We were talking about Scientology documentaries and you recommended Going Clear to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I've seen that like six times. Every time someone comes over, I'm like, you have to watch this documentary. I've watched it twice, but I would watch it again. Definitely. It's amazing. Like so much detail. And the Leah Remini one is really good as well. Yeah, definitely. It's, It's heavy, but it's good. So good. I want to know where David Miscavige's wife is. Um, there's a rumor that she's in Ireland. I heard a rumor that she's I mean you would probably know better than me because you're a bit more up on the Scientology stuff being in the heartland of it and all but um (laughs) I'm literally across the street from a huge Scientology building can you get a picture of the Scientology building without them like knocking on your door and being weird to you yeah but then also they'll definitely know who I am (laughs) I won't tag them (laughs) I won't tag them I promise (laughs) They don't have time to listen to podcasts. They're too busy swearing their lives for like a million years to the sea. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Wait, where oh. do you think his wife is? Oh, so I think his wife is um, in the same place that, you know, they had a guy who was like in charge of the press and he left and he's in the show with Leah Remini. And there's like. And they a make pr- him go to like a hole. Yeah, the hole. Yeah. They yeah. take them to like a prison, basically. And you can yeah. be there just indefinitely. Right. For, like, crimes against L. Ron Hubbard, whatever. Yeah, and they, like, make you sit on a chair in in a dank room. Yeah, and if you move, you have to, like, start again or whatever. Like, right. all yeah. this kind of weird fucking mind game shit. So I think she's probably just, like, in a weird prison somewhere. Okay, well, that was an awesome story, Rage. Thanks. And yeah. thanks, everyone, for listening this week. If you would like a Transatlantic Prime sticker, then there's only one way to get one. And that has become a Patreon. (laughs) Please give us money so we can carry on doing this. Yeah, we really enjoy it. Pretty soon we'll have more things like a bingo card. Yes, which Um, I'm I'm going on a train tomorrow. So I'm going to use my time to create a bingo card. 
nice. And yeah. maybe we'll have some bonus content, maybe some film and book recommendations about Scientology murders. gossip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scientology gossip with Talissa and Rachel. Yeah, it's all conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> Sign up today. It's just different angles. Every day I go out and get different angles of the Scientology building. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Rach. I'm off to Bedfordshire. All right, I'm about to go do the rest of my day because it's midday here. So okay. have a good sleep and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon, mate. Bye. Thanks for listening to Transatlantic Crime this week. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Transat Crime Pod, Instagram at Transatlantic Crime, and on Facebook with Transatlantic Crime Podcast. Thanks, bye. <laughs>